So we move into chapter 16 and the first five vials. Um, Revelation 16 verse 1 reads, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And these vials of the wrath of God, the effects of them were seen during this period of time we've got here, uh, 1793 through to round about 1820. Right, so the first vial, which speaks about the French Revolution, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 2, we read there, the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and them which worshipped his image. There broke out, it was a noisome and grievous sore. Now, first of all, that word noisome, and this is Vine's expository dictionary of New Testament words. He says it's the Greek word kakos. Um, if there's anyone who knows Greek please excuse my pronunciation of these words so this means bad in character he says morally by way of thinking and then feeling and acting and that's quite important that we, we see that it's a noisome sore a noisome means because of the way in which people think and eventually because of the way they think they and that's the way that they act and uh, Vine gives us an example where else it's used there in Mark chapter 7 and verse 21 where the Lord Jesus Christ says for from within out of the heart of men how they think proceed evil thoughts adulteries fornications murders It is a noisome and grievous sore, the prophecy tells us. That means bad in effect. The same word is used in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34. It's translated evil once again. Where Jesus says, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. What's coming out of you, says Jesus, is what's inside you from the way that you are thinking in the heart. Now, Vine also says, where these two words, kakos and paneros, are put together, kakos is always put first, namely bad in thinking, base, and then bad in effect, that's the paneros malignant it's a noisome and grievous sore Vine says it's a wound a wound producing a discharge or a pus an ulcer so it fell on those it fell on the, the beast and it was on the earth it is actually the beast of the earth which is being judged here which is known in history as the Holy Roman Empire it had two horns one was the Emperor and the other was the Pope and it persecuted the Saints as well and we've already looked at that uh, it, a little earlier on There's the territory of the beast, as shown on a map that was in the year 1500 AD. Middle Europe really, isn't it? There fell a noisome and grievous sore. Once again, let's consider that. Here's another um, definition of that word. An ulcer, an open running sore resulting from a local inflammation 
and what we see is that that inflammation was in fact the French Revolution and the effects of that revolution are seen in the first six vials. This is how one writer describes the French Revolution a phenomenon as awful and irreversible as the first nuclear explosion and all history has been permanently changed by it. This was a momentous event, the French Revolution. If we consider just very briefly the French Revolution and what happened, um, it was when the peasants rose up against the aristocracy, wasn't it? And the, the feudal order was abolished to begin with. And then we get the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And following on from that, the civil constitution of the clergy, because the clergy were amongst the aristocracy, i.e. their property was nationalised, the concordat with Rome was abolished, and French clergy no longer under the jurisdiction of the Pope. And so we see the power and the authority of the Pope being eroded away here. What followed on from that, in 1792, France was proclaimed a republic, the people's public. And then in 93 and 1794, we've got the reign of terror, when the guillotine was very busy, mass executions of enemies of the revolution. Uh, later on, the revolution spread to the military, and that eventually uh, resulted in Napoleon Bonaparte emerging as this invincible leader and we come back to Napoleon when we look at the third vial so let's move into the second vial Revelation 16 verse 3 we read there the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. So what we're saying is, this is the British Navy controlling the movements of Napoleon. You see, Napoleon was victorious when he got on with the job allocated him by the prophecy, namely to bring an end to the Holy Roman Empire. But when he moved out of that sphere, he was defeated every time and it was usually the British that were doing that because they had a worldwide empire. There's a map from the Penguin Atlas of World History. It's headed Napoleon's worldwide power struggle with Britain. As we said, whenever he moved out of Europe, he was defeated by the British very often. The prophecy says the sea became as the blood of a dead man and then every living soul died in the sea. Now when we think about this, the blood of a dead man no longer circulates around the body and it is lifeless. And that is exactly what happened here. In November 1806, Napoleon set up a blockade, a forcible closing of ports to prevent all trade and communication between Great Britain and other European nations. He called this policy the Continental System because it was supposed to make Continental Europe more self-sufficient. Napoleon also intended to destroy Britain's commercial and industrial economy. But that blockade backfired on him. because Britain did the same thing to France. And the Penguin Atlas of World History here comments, the blockade of French ports and the seizure of ships increased the British fleet by 2,000 vessels a year at this time. So there we've got the blood of a dead man 
it no longer circulated and, and all movements on, on the ocean were blockaded at this time. So thinking about this, Napoleon's battles when he was defeated by Britain just in this area, 1798, 1801, 1805, 1806, whenever he moved out of that area that he was supposed to be dealing with, he was defeated by Britain. This is what Brother Thomas says in Eureka. The ocean being cleared thus of the warships belonging to Babylon, to the, sorry, to the power of Babylon, the great, every seafaring living soul was, to all intents and purposes of war, dead. When Britain ruled the waves, there was no living soul afloat to fire a gun at her dismay. And then it says, the French upon the land and the British upon the sea were the contemporary agents of the seven spirits for the torment of the worshippers of the beast's image. Here's another example from the Penguin Atlas, how the, the blockade uh, in the Mediterranean there uh, scuppered Napoleon's attempts to conquer the Middle East, because Nelson set up that blockade to, to cut off uh, Nelson's navy from France and so the whole thing collapsed so we move into the third vial uh, Revelation 16 and at verse 4 the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters and they became blood and I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, and wast, and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. So it was on the rivers and fountains of waters. And we saw this earlier on in the prophecy, when we're looking at the, the trumpet section. The prophecy is speaking about the place where all the major rivers of Europe had their fountain, had their beginning. And we see here all the major rivers of Europe. Really, basically, we're looking at the territory of the Holy Roman Empire once again. And there's the verse which speaks about it uh, back in the trumpet section. Same area of uh, Europe. There it is on the map, the Holy Roman Empire. And when Napoleon concentrated on this area, he was victorious every time. French defeat the Austrians. French occupy Milan. French gains Belgium and Luxembourg. French take Piedmont. And finally, Napoleon enters Vienna the capital of the Holy Roman Empire. So, here we are looking at the Angel of the Waters. We read it, didn't we? The angel controlling the area where the rivers had their fountains or springs, the territory of the beast. And we read, didn't we, how that, that angel was rejoicing um, verse 6 the angel said for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink for they are worthy and I heard another out of the altar say even so Lord God Almighty for true and righteous are thy judgments this angel had witnessed the past atrocities of the beast and now rejoices at the righteous judgments brought on this system.
And so we come to the fourth vial. That was poured out upon the sun. Um, verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his blood upon the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him the glory. So upon the sun, the sun was the ruler, the emperor, as far as the Holy Roman Empire was concerned. We know the sun was given back in Genesis to rule, don't we? And there are many examples of the sun representing the ruler, the political ruler. A quote is from the Chronicle of the World, August the 1st, 1806, Napoleon gives notice to the Emperor France the second of the end of the Holy Roman Empire. On August the 6th, the Holy Roman Emperor accepts Napoleon's ultimatum and abdicates. And here we see the balcony on which he stood to do that, to concede defeat to Napoleon. It's on the Church of the Nine Angels in Vienna. The prophecy says power was given to him to scorch men with fire. Napoleon was known as the King of Fire because he used great he used this to great effect in his battles. A few artists' impressions here of the battles of Napoleon, the Napoleonic Wars, and fire was evident each time. So the fifth vial, um, chapter t uh, 16 and verse 10. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. It was on the seat of the beast. A quote here from Bryce's book on the Holy Roman Empire. He says, Neither did anyone doubt where the seat of authority lay. Rome, whence the Caesars had ruled the world. Rome, where the chief of the apostles had exercised the pastorate given to him by God. Or so he thought. That was the seat of the beast. We see here a page from a book written by Joseph Mead back in 1643, more than 150 years before these events took place. And here we've got an example of the way in which people down the ages have been able to see from this prophecy events before they take place. This is what he said. The fifth vial is to be poured out upon the throne or seat of the beast that is Rome itself where the Holy Ghost hideth not the matter any more with any veil or figures or allegories happily because of the great light which shall then arise to these prophecies by this most evident figure whereby it shall then be clear what vials are past and what is to come he went on to say now by this destruction of the city of Rome and he got that bit wrong didn't he because Rome itself wasn't destroyed but the next bit he got entirely right he says the name of the Pope shall not indeed utterly perish but from henceforth he shall be de deployed of his glory and splendour 
and that is exactly what happened here's the chronicle of the world again speaks about the defiant pope pope pius the seventh and his secretary were arrested yesterday on the orders of the french general and sent to grenoble right so that they are now locked up as it were Two months early, when Napoleon annexed the Papal States to his empire, Pius issued a bull of excommunication against the despoilers of the Church. But it was too late. The, 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 the game was up for the Pope at this stage. So, the Holy Roman Empire, described in the prophecy as the two-horned beast of the earth, one horn was removed in the fourth file the other in the fifth and that completely brought an end to the holy roman empire as it was called but we've read haven't we that they repented not of their deeds they blasphemed the name of the god and repented not to give him glory we read here one of the most remarkable facts about the final outcome of Vatican Council I in 1870 was the way the vote went on papal infallibility. Out of 535 prelates who voted, 533 of them cast affirmative responses. It was an overwhelming vote to say that the Pope was infallible. However, it should be pointed out that 106 of the members were absent and why were they absent the day before the momentous vote was cast one of the opposition leaders persuaded those remaining in rome to leave in a body and thus avoid a negative vote and so the book paper power tells us how they achieved that amazing vote that they got rid of all those who might well uh, cast a negative vote as they saw it We read in the same book here, the first dogmatic constitution concerning the Church of Christ, July 1870, same year. If anyone therefore shall say that blessed Peter an apostle was not appointed prince of all the apostles and the visible head of the whole church militant, let him be anathema. Or again, since by the divine right of apostolic primacy the roman pontiff is placed over the universal church we further teach and declare that he is the supreme of the faithful and that in all causes the decisions of which belongs up to the church that none may reopen the judgment of the apostolic see nor can any lawfully review its judgment once the apostolic see has spoken that's it there's no changing it and that's the way that the, uh, the apostasy was at that time Paul speaks about it doesn't he there in St Thessalonians 2 and verse 4 the one who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God but the faithful were warned though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed there's the anathema But we say finally the beast was not destroyed it was robbed of its power to persecute because there is another phase of this beast which we see emerging in the world today in Europe today you see it's reserved for the Lord Jesus Christ and the Saints to destroy this beast with the brightness of his coming and we know also from later on in this chapter that the beast is there still these frog spirits are coming out of the mouth of 
the dragon, the beast and the false prophet and that's something that we should consider next time.